Great. So let's start. So hello, everyone, and welcome uh, to this webinar, Local Peace Processes Amid Fragmented Conflict, that will feature insights about um, the local as a space for conflict resolution, and um, that will reflect on what questions the practices of local peace processes raise for contemporary peacemaking. My name is Julien Beaujon. I am a postdoctoral research fellow with the um, Peace and Conflict Resolution Evidence Platform, or PeaceRep, based, based at the University of Edinburgh. Today, you will be hearing presentations from four uh, distinguished speakers. Uh, first, we should have Professor Christine Bell from the Peace and Conflict Resolution Evidence Platform um, at the University of Edinburgh. Then we will have Professor Mary Keldor and Rim Turkmani. They are both from the Conflict Research Program at LSE. And last but not least, uh, Jan Pospisil from the Austrian Studies Center for Peace and Conflict Resolution. All speakers and their affiliated institutions are part of the same consortium, which is PeaceRep, and which Christine will uh, shortly introduce in a few minutes. So I, I won't tell you more right now. All speakers will share with you the key findings of three main outputs. Uh, the first one is a report that was published by the British Academy in September 2021, so just a few months ago, and um, that followed a series of joint analysis workshops on local peace processes undertaken in 2019 and 2020. The workshops were organized uh, by the Political Settlement Research Programme, PSRP, the Austrian Studies Centre for Peace and Conflict Resolution, the University of Edinburgh and British Academy, and they were funded by the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, FCDO. The contribution to this report suggests the existence of local peacemaking and the impossibility of delimiting uh, what is merely local about it, which in turn points to a need for a new political imaginary for peace processes, which would go beyond the idea that um, it is about brokering elite pacts reached in a comprehensive peace agreement. Um, I believe that uh, throughout the, the event, uh, Alison will kindly add the links to, to this output I'm mentioning right now. So keep an eye on the chat if you want to learn more uh, about all these outputs. And then we have the second and the third outputs. Uh, there is one memo called War and Peace Logics and one special issue of the Peace Building Journal that has not been published yet. So we're very lucky to hear about um, this in exclusivity. I believe that, uh, Mary, you, you can uh, confirm this later. I think this special issue will be out in a few weeks, in early March. Uh, and again, here, I, I will let Mary tell us a bit more about this. So each speaker will have uh, seven to 10 minutes. I will let you know through the chat when you hit minute seven, and uh, I, will, I will try to kindly interrupt you at minute nine to ask you to conclude your presentation, but I hope I did not have to do that. Um, this should give us 15 to 20 minutes for discussions. We will take all the questions through the chat um, and I will ask you to please keep your questions quite clear and short so that we can take as many as possible. Uh, a few housekeeping rules. Uh, please be aware that the presentation will be recorded. The recording started already, but the Q&A session and the following discussions will be held under uh, Chatham House rules. The recording will uh, later be made available after the event. So if you would like to, to view it again, listen to the presentations again, or if you know friends and colleagues who could not join us today, you will be able to um, actually find the recording by visiting uh, our website, uh, the politicalsettlements.org website. So I can see Christina has arrived, so that's fantastic. We can start. Um, Christina, I, I will let you uh, start if it's all right with you. And uh, well, I, I hope you, you all enjoy the presentations. That's great. Sorry, somehow I had managed to join not as a panelist. I was actually here, but I couldn't be seen. Sorry about that. Um, so firstly, just to add my thanks to everybody um, for coming. I wanted to just say a little bit about the programme and what we're doing and why the local work how it sort of informs um, our approach. Uh, so the uh, Peace Track programme, I think, is really responding to what is a current reality, which is that while we've often thought of peace processes as being about a kind of 
state and, for, and various non-state armed groups and then brokering forms of agreement, often through mediation uh, to kind of end conflict and then create the possibility for um, less conflicted politics to take place, a violent conflict. Um, that's sort of starting not to really, um, and for some time maybe hasn't really reflected the way in which conflict works anymore. So we're seeing conflict often in countries as a lot of different conflicts that relate to each other in quite a complex mesh. Uh, and where there's, instead of conflict just within a state, you've also conflict across state borders, you've geopolitical conflict that's playing out within states. And I suppose the question is, what does that mean for how we have tried to support um, exits from conflict. And I think around us, the same time, the researchers in this panel and others in other institutions were also aware that in focusing on comprehensive peace deals, we often sort of miss a kind of texture of ways that people end conflicts at levels that are less visible than the big mediation that tends to hit the international news headlines. And we were aware that this mediation happens in a number of different ways, and I think the research report has started to document that. Sometimes it's mediation that flows out of local justice processes that have existed, you know, independently of conflict and independently of mediated solution conflict to conflict. Sometimes it rolls out from almost water development type projects that begin to deal with, say, intercommunal conflicts at a village or town level. Sometimes it's when the state itself decides to broker directly with um, a particular locale or set of groups. And sometimes it's where armed groups themselves come to sorts of settlement between, their, between uh, each other. So all of these things give rise to local agreements that aren't always in the same thing. They aren't always about peace. Sometimes they're about peace in one direction and conflict in another in ways that we might think um, add to the overall quality of peace in ways that we might think maybe subtract from the quality of peace. So for example, two armed groups may agree not to fight each other, all the better to fight somebody else. Uh, and often they will create, um, there are other types of agreements that will create local settlements. Um, one of the things we're look, I suppose that's always asked both of the people who seek support for these peace brokering at the local level, and also I suppose of the institutions that are involved trying to support peace processes are, what is the potential of these local agreements for a broader um, peace settlement? Can they add up to something? Or do they support and manage um, other conflicts that might either destroy confidence for a peace settlement or where resolution could build confidence for a peace settlement. And I think um, I think some of that misses, I suppose, just stepping back and under, trying to understand these agreements on their own terms. Uh, and one of the things and what they do and also be open minded to the differentiation between them. Uh, one of the things uh, that I have been doing in my work has been trying to um, understand the spaces and the sort of more the fragmented spaces that local agreements um, create. And I would just suggest, I think, three types of space that are created by these local agreements. One is what I've called a sort of terri territorial limited but scalar space of peace. So local agreements might create a form of territorially limited peace that is its own little political settlement in ways that become, um, I like this word fractal. So a fractal is sometimes where you have a leaf that looks like a little tree on a tree, right? So it's like a mini version of the whole thing. Um, and these agreements can in some senses be emblematic of the possibility of peace for a wider scale, even where they don't have a tangible link to it. The second type of space is actually interface spaces. So often these peace settlements, local agreements will create the interface itself as a more constructive space of interaction because it helps maybe manage checkpoints, establish delimitation of groups that are fighting. 
And the third space, I think, is a really interesting one. So I was a bit influenced here, and I, the book is seen as problematic now, but by Bruce Chatwin's songlines. So the, I had originally in my head thought of this as a songline space, but I call it root of passage space. So pass, space is created by people traveling along lines and passages and roadways. So if we think about how a roadway is a space, often local agreements deal with the pastoralists that need to travel through somewhere, or maybe the humanitarian workers that need to travel through to deliver goods. And they often actually constitute the lines of travel as spaces of, say, protection or enablement. So peace agreements provide these spaces. And I suppose the question is, in providing these spaces, they also fragment the conflict landscape and sometimes the peace landscape as well. So I suppose like from our work, and I think what's interesting, and there's a resonance between the work and the work has all been in conversation with each other, which this conversation today is a part of, we would sort of see it as part of a broader tapestry that we're trying to move forward with as a research agenda within the Peace Threat Programme of understanding this new fragmented landscape. And instead of trying to say, how do we make fit everything into the old peace process from this place, to try to say, how do we understand what's going on and what types of um, you know, what types of sort of movement are possible uh, in these fragmented landscapes? What do they mean for the reinvention of peace processes as a whole? Because I think there is a consensus that that type of reintervention is both underway and needs to happen, but we don't know what its landing zone is yet. So I'll just stop there. Perfect, Christine, right on time. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for this great presentation that shows not only that local peace agreements tend to be born within fragmented conflict, but in turn, they might actually contribute to reinforce the fragmentation of the conflict and the peace landscape. Um, Jan, would you like to go next? Yes, um, let me turn on the video. So I hope it works. I'm uh, oh, on mobile data. Oh, I me. Ah, Mary, sorry. It's me, Mary. <laughs> Yes, okay, I don't mind. Do you want to go next or shall I go no, next? No, no. Okay. I don't mind. Mary goes next. Okay. So um, I, I'm going to talk about the research that was undertaken in the conflict research programme, but actually we cooperated quite a lot with the political settlements programme and the PATS database, the PATS local database was really useful for us. And we worked with Jan, who will no doubt talk about some of the things he found. And we participated in the British Academy. So in a sense, even before we all became peace rep, we'd started working together. And so our conclusions are very much shaped by that. So I'm just gonna tell you briefly, we, we produced a memo that summarizes our conclusions and uh, a lot of our research is going to be contained in a special issue of the Journal of Peacebuilding, which we hope, as Julian said, will be published soon. Uh, there are some other bits of research too, which we refer to in the footnotes. Uh, we covered five sites, Iraq, Syria, Congo, South Sudan and Somalia, but we also made use of quantitative material, both from PAX Local and uh, from the Centre for Security Studies in Zurich. And I'll tell you a little bit about that, but we've only, I've only got seven minutes. Um, so let me say, I mean, I, the first point is there is a new interest in local agreements and it looks as though local agreements actually are increasing, but we don't know whether they're increasing or not because the data just shows that we started counting them. <laughs> and it's certainly the case that more and more local agreements are written down. Um, certainly, we know that local agreements have a long history. There was some very exciting examples in the English Civil War in the 1600s of local agreements. But my intuition, and this accords with what um, Christine was saying, is that local agreements are increasing because of the fragmented and decentralised nature of contemporary conflicts. In a way, this is the only way that people survive. There have to be local agreements for all sorts of reasons, whether it's tactical military reasons 
or whether it's getting humanitarian aid into a particular area. So I think local agreements are a pervasive feature of contemporary conflicts and our data suggests that too. Um, in a minute, uh, Reem will talk about the, I think, 400 examples that she has in her database of local agreements in Syria. Um, and what I think the interesting point, which is really where Christine ended, is that some agreements just have to do with the war. Some agreements are about tactical redeployment of armed forces. Some agreements are about surrenders. Uh, but some agreements actually do reduce violence and actually make life better for local people. And they may also have positive implications for the overall settlement. Um, but the key point is that they have some of those agreements that reduce violence, that make access to public services, make the ordinary people's lives a little bit better, do have a value in themselves. And so in our paper, we talk about a peace logic by which we mean, does it lead to reductions in violence and improvements in everyday lives and a war logic. And of course, these aren't really clear cut. They're very overlapping. <laughs> sometimes you may have elements of both, or sometimes you might get peace in one region, which actually displaces the fighting to another region. So it's not clear cut, but nevertheless, we thought it was useful to think about when might agreements be more conducive to winding down a conflict than others. And that was the sort of our big question. So what did we conclude? Well, I'll say this very briefly. I mean, first of all, I think a very interesting thing about local agreements is they're not really about the sort of constitutional issues that national agreements are about. They're about concrete issues. They're about removing a checkpoint, removing a siege, a, a local ceasefire, an exchange of prisoners. They're about very concrete access for humanitarian aid. We have a long list in our paper of the kinds of things they're about. And um, I think the main conclusion from that is that actually what you need, if you're going to link the local to the national, is that there needs to be a much greater emphasis on concrete issues as opposed to constitutional issues at the national level. So that's one conclusion. A second conclusion, which I think is probably the most interesting thing we find in our research, is that who are the actors matter? <laughs> we do find that where multilateral actors are present, uh, the UN, for example, and where civilians play a part in the negotiation process, um, at final agreements are more likely to be closer to a peace logic than they are to a war logic. And we find that partly from our case studies, especially the case studies in Syria, which show that, for example, when you have external actors who are, who are supporting one or other of the warring parties, say Iran and Russia, you tend to have uh, agreements that don't help local civilians and that don't last as long. Um, and when you have multilateral actors, they tend to bring in civilian concerns. But also it came out of the quantitative research primarily on Africa, that sort of a survey of ceasefires showed that where you had peacekeepers present or where you had multilateral mediation, these agreements tended to be more durable. There's lots more research to be done on that, but I think this is a really interesting conclusion and we spell out what are the kinds of roles multilateral actors might play from providing logistics, from mediation, monitoring and upholding an agreement. Um, a fourth conclusion is that process matters. The more that you negotiate, the more there is a tendency to reduce violence. So it's not just a matter of reaching an agreement. It's a matter of an ongoing process of talks. And then a fourth conclusion is that data matters. It's incredibly important to have a granular understanding of local ceasefires. And it's quite difficult to get that through media reports. It's really important to collect information on the ground. And I know Reem 
we'll say more about that. I want to end here, but I want to make a final remark, which is that in all our analyses of conflict, of this fragmented, decentralized type of conflict we're all discussing, we find that the conflict, I, I use the term, is more like a social condition than a deep-seated contest between two sides. And it's a social condition in which various actors gain from violence rather than from winning. They gain politically uh, from uh, mobilizing extremist ideologies, or they gain economically from, say, checkpoints or hostage taking or loot and pillage. And I think the key point is that local agreements offer you a way in for reversing the social condition that is very interesting, not on their own. They're part of an ecology of agreements that involve the national and the regional and the international as well. But nevertheless, that's, they're an area that's been neglected up till now. And I do think provide a significant opportunity. So I'll end there, Julien. Thank you very much, Mary, for offering the great insights into your most recent research on local peace agreement. And I'm sure that just like me, the audience is now looking forward to reading the whole special issue um, to learn more about uh, your research. Um, I think that because Rem is in between me, two meetings yeah, and I'm, I'm so sorry about it but if we give mm -hmm. Rem the opportunity to present right now if, if it works with yeah. everyone really yes um, really. Rem are, are you ready to present uh, yes I am just one Great. second thank you yeah. <clears throat> so you can hear me clearly yes okay great thank you very much um so uh, I'm going to tr present now just uh, the outcome of one piece of research uh, we've done on local agreements uh, that try to explain how local agreements are actually the long process rather than just one agreement, you know, that happened at a particular date and that, that there is before and after uh, the agreement. And this is based on a research that will be published uh, uh, very soon in the Peace Building Journal. Um, the, this research relied on uh, very uh, uh, rich empirical sources, including two main sources. One is uh, the local um, uh, agreements uh, in, uh, uh, in Syria uh, archive, uh, it's called LASA, which I developed over many years, is uh, partly published with the, with the paper, but not fully. And it follows the, uh, it takes every area in Syria and follows the uh, development of agreements um, in this area uh, uh, over uh, the years and put it in the context of the uh, local conflict. The second source is um, the more detailed, very micro level database that came out of a different research project um, and that covered the conflict events in, in Syria on daily basis. Uh, so it's called Conflict Events Database. We tried to, it was a pilot project to try something new, which is when we're mapping conflict where people usually map the violent events, number of casualties, we said like, it's also important to map simultaneously the same methodology with the same uh, uh, tool, also the peaceful events, and then see what's the relationship between the peaceful and violent events and what can we learn from that. So most of the learning of, from what I'm gonna present comes from this, comes from mapping at the same time, peaceful and non-peaceful events. And with the peaceful events, you know, we included the local talks, any local talks happening in the area we're studying, um, uh, uh, we're also mapped uh, uh, in the in the uh, uh, in this research. Uh, just one minute. So uh, through this database um, or this pl uh, platform that we created, we had a very uh, we designed a very secure web platform uh, that involved detailed question, uh, detailed structured questionnaires for each type of events, violent and non-violence, and even also looting, like economic uh, uh, events, uh, kidnapping, ransom. Uh, uh, so we developed these questionnaires and then we trained the network of local researchers on the ground in every area in Syria and several of them in every area um, 
and ask them to fill these questionnaires on daily basis. So we end up having very rich, many, many thousands of events uh, over about 14 months period uh, in Syria between August and October, uh, August 2015. Uh, September 2016 through crowd seed uh, 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 conflict uh, uh, mapping. Uh, so I took this data, this very granular data, and I looked at a particular area, which is Homs. And uh, during that area, luckily, there was a process of local agreements going on. So we tried to analyze the data of the violent and peaceful events and see what was the impact of the local talks on, on the uh, violent events, on the number of casualties uh, and so forth. So when we looked at the data over this about 13 months period in Homs, uh, back in Homs, by the way, the area we looked at was a Loire area. It's a, a large suburb of Homs that was under siege. Uh, it was controlled by the opposition and there were continuous shelling uh, of this area by the government forces. And the civilians were trapped inside with the opposition control, controlling the scene. And there were actors inside, whether civic actors, armed actors, trying to negotiate with the government to reach uh, uh, a ceasefire. Uh, so we had a siege situation as well and the humanitarian you know, needs and so forth. Uh, so when we looked at the data, we found very clear um, period you know, in, throughout these 13 months, like period of peace when there's hardly any violence. Uh, and then suddenly everything escalates and you have a period of vi you know, intense violence and then falls by another period of peace and so forth. So we had three periods of peace, usually they're longer periods, and then there were three periods of violence. So we tried to compare also the data between these different periods and what led to what initiated a certain period uh, uh, as well. So when we compared the figures of the peaceful and violent periods, the very, very stark image emerges, which is that during the peaceful periods when local talks were ongoing, although agreement haven't been reached, but just the fact that the locals inside are talking to the, to the government, people like civilians particularly were 26 times more likely not to be killed and 31 times more likely not to be injured as a result of violence. Not only that, also service restoration, ill delivery was 16 times more likely to take place during the periods when talks were going on, even if agreement was not reached. So in other words, when local talks were taking place, even if there is no final agreement, there was substantial improvement to the lives of the civilians in terms of reducing violence, likelihood of death and injury, and the quality of life itself. Right? So um, what, what, think, what this suggests really that the significance and relevance of local agreements should not only be seen through the lens of how it supports a top level process because we even get often get asked like okay how can we take this up to the you know top level how can this support the top, top level talks now these processes have value in their own right that cannot even be achieved at the top level and we should always uh, you know stress this and let them take play, you know uh, 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 let them unfold uh, without much interference uh, from the outside uh, and I'll come back to that again, kind of what type of interference. Um, the other thing we'd like to look at is like why there are talks, why the talks fall apart. So we found that every peace, peaceful period often starts with a very sharp increase of violence uh, that leads to the talks. So then there will be the regime, for example, escalate uh, the use of violence. That creates a lot of frustration among the civilians. So the civilians pressure the leadership in their area who then reach out to the regime and they start talks. Once the talks start, there will be peace, right? Even if they don't agree the terms. Uh, and then eventually they keep talking and talking. It takes at times, they put condition back and forth and then talks fall apart. And they often fall apart when they disagree on a particular term, often it's the release of detainees. And with this uh, uh, falling apart of the talks, what happens, everyone goes back home and violence starts again. And you see the violence used again as a way to leverage the talks and to bring the other party back to the table with lesser 
expectations. Yeah. So the violence and peace here are playing together, and you know, there's always intermittently negotiated agreement where the violence is part of the negotiations of this uh, agreement. Um, but what we also found out is um, uh, when we followed the kind of the whole flow of the events is that throughout the local talk process, there were two competing logics going on uh, at the same time in every agreement. So there is like one good and one bad agreement and every agreement there are good and bad elements and there, there are two logics at play. Uh, there's uh, the logics of violence and the logic of peace. And the logic of violence was mainly, but not solely, driven by armed and security actors and some political leaders who believe that they can only leverage talk through violence. Whereas the more peaceful logic was mainly promoted by civic actors and leaders and some of the armed actors or political actors who believe that a military solution will be costly and is not even viable. Uh, so the competing logics existed on both sides of the table, right? Uh, but what's also important is the more civil society is involved, the more you're able to push the civic logic and the more the UN is able to be present. You know, the, the multilateral presence was helping this uh, civic logic. So we found several areas where the UN was able to interfere a little bit, but not much. Sometimes attending the talks, sometimes uh, delivering aid, uh, sometimes observing the talks, putting in new very civic conditions, you know, and within the talks. So they were able to, uh, to interfere, but not, not much. So, um, so when the UN was allowed minimum intervention space, it was then able to protect civilians, improve humanitarian conditions, and offset some of the negative impacts of the external partisan actors. Uh, because the other external actors like let's say Russia, Iran, or some of the countries supporting the opposition, especially the Gulf countries, was very, very unhelpful. So then comes the UN more un UN multilateral, more neutral. It was able to kind of support uh, the civic logic of that process. So, but because of the lack of a formal mandate to enable such intervention for the UN at this local level, uh, at the local talks, uh, usually the mandate is you know fixed at the top level, Geneva processes this type. Uh, because of the lack of mandate, they, they just stand on the side, hardly able to do anything. Uh, if the local ask them to come in, they will come in. But then if one of the actors say, we don't want you, there's not much they can do and they have to remain outside. Sometimes they've been called as implementers. So everyone agrees what to do. And then they call the UN and say, can you implement? Can you move people around? Can you do this? Can you deliver aid and, and so forth? But it was clear that the greater multilateral presence could have strengthened the role of civil society, protected civilians, and kept the uh, locally initiated civic uh, processes alive, because that's the other finding, is that we found actually very important uh, so talk that started. Do, do Hello? you think you could, I'm so sorry for interrupting, you think you could wrap up in 30 yeah. seconds, please? Yes, Thank I can. Thank you very yeah. much. That, because Thank that's you. my last statement, is that we found uh, uh, that they were very important uh, civic uh, or civil society led initiatives for uh, peace talks, but they were unable to succeed because of the external interventions from the uh, 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 intervening states and the UN presence could have helped to support these types of uh, initiatives in particular. And I'll just end here. Thank you so very much, Trim. Um, sorry about this. I mean, this is indeed one of the most fascinating case study when it comes to the study of local peace agreements. And uh, I personally wouldn't mind speaking about it for hours, but unfortunately our time is limited today. Um, as I said before, last but not least, Tian, thank you so very much for your patience and, uh, you know, for letting everybody speak before you. And um, I, I now give you the floor for about seven minutes. And yeah, I okay. think you have a PowerPoint to share. Yeah, because it's actually, it's a bit uh, celebrating um, this publication that I'm showing here. Uh, this is the British Academy um, volume that we um, published um, as an outcome of the joint analysis workshops that Christine mentioned in the beginning that we did in, in uh, London and Nairobi, focusing on quite a few um, local processes. This is just to give you a, a glimpse of, of what is in this volume. So we look at cases like uh, South Sudan, Libya here, Jordan, DRC, Colombia, Pakistan, which was which is 
especially for local peace agreements, a very interesting area, but also some more cases that are not uh, in, in this volume. And then we try to come up with some of the conclusions that have already been um, mentioned by, by Christine and Mary in the beginning, just to, to, to sum, up, sum up some of the, I think, most relevant findings that we came up with is that we, we have to really look into, into conflict settings, into like ecologies of conflict and peacemaking. Um, and as I then come to, to this point of what we learned from this, I think the, 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 the way we have learned to think about conflict in terms of hierarchies is indeed something that, it is, question, that is questioned by, by these initiatives, especially of local peacemaking. Uh, I think also important, all these conflicts have political dimensions, even though if they are very issue-centered, a point that Mary has highlighted, and I will come to that as well. And um, it's still it's important to see that this is basically politics at play, um, and politics at play at, 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 at several levels at once, and that these processes most of the time are interwoven. It's not clear w at what um, levers they actually are so it's in a way also difficult for us to say what is actually local what what is the definition of local in 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 these places um particularly interesting i thought is where roger mcginty's conclusions i've seen he is in the event so it would be great if he can then in the discussion even talk more about this he his his argument was that like thinking about scale is, is one of the the real questions that come out because these processes are multi-scalar multidimensional, they raise these power issues. So it is not really clear where to put them. And uh, as we've heard from some of the examples before, it's often that um, various levels from the state, from the international come to the agreements. RIM has, has, has just told us about the, the important role of the United Nations as a basically international organization. Some of these questions of, 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 of local peacemaking. I'm, I'm at the moment here in, in Juba where you, we have the same, of, for example, an FCDO funded program that work quite a lot uh, at local peacemaking. So it is, it is, it is a space of, of like uh, where, where several levels come together. And as Roger also highlighted, that it's something that also invites us to rethink what peace and conflict actually are as concepts, because they, they are not an either or situation, but often something that can be that can happen, but also can be basically nego negotiated or, or kind of processed simultaneously. And this um, comes to this to this concept of fragments that that we try to particularly explore in its usefulness for for peace and conflict studies, but also for, for peace policy um, in our program. So, what are the outcomes? And I've, I've mentioned them before as well. So, the first uh, important outcome, I'd say that we have to, I think, get away from this very hierarchical um, thinking about conflict, but also about peacemaking, like questions like, what do local peace agreements do for the national level? It's, it's basically, as, as Mary said, an ecology we have to think about. It's about um, multiplicity of processes that might not all work the same, but actually help in transforming and shifting logics. Um, we often see, especially with international organizations, uh, uh, problems also in terminology that run a bit deeper between like armed conflict groups, like armed fighting and then intercommunal violence, which becomes a more blurred term. And um, so it, in a sense, kind of the, the dimension of what peacemaking is um, um, gets a bit lost in language often in international um, organizations, particularly and international partners. And I think it's important to say that these, these levels, um, national, subnational, local, are overlapping as said, that it is worthwhile to engage in political processes which are subnational, local, and that they are not like something different necessarily than the national, because it's both like, it, 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 is, it is both about basically whole setting and kind of shifting logics in, in a setting as a whole. And the second, um, that's where I come to an end. The second, I think, element is what Mary already highlighted, taking issues seriously. Um, local peace agreements are a lot about so, like addressing concrete issues, concrete problems. We've also found out here in the study I'm involved with, for instance, that uh, in South Sudan, 
areas where an everyday peace situation is like better compared to the other areas, there's also more public buy-in, more trust to what is there as an official, basically, peace process or transitional process. So it shows that it is about thinking of people, about trust into a system, about like institutions of conflict management that are there. And it invites also then a step, to go a step further about the question of what conflict actually is. Because what liberal, and I think here is a bit the, the critique in this of, of the liberal peace building concept, that we also think always think about conflict as something that is caused by, by the root cause, the big things we have, basically what the UN uses as this root causes, proximate causes, trigger factors. But this distinction might not be that helpful always, because often perhaps like a conflict evolves out of, of just triggers and unfortunate developments and the lack of institutions that are able to manage them at a non kind of national or not national level. And this can spill and broaden and like addressing these issues means also thinking about conflict um, as something which is to be handled perhaps more pragmatically and not with this big bang idea shifting or like addressing root causes in the final kind of, 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 of way, but more in a step-by-step, -step, very pragmatic way of, of turning logics towards peace logic. With that, I close and back to you, Julian, for the discussion. Thank you very, very much, Jan, for summarizing such important finding in a very small amount of time and, and for linking it back to the question of fragmentation and some of the key debates in the current literature. So the loop is, is closed, I think. We now have finished hearing to four very insightful presentations and I'm